When the film Steamboat Bill Jr. began production on July 15, 1927, Buster Keaton found himself at a career crossroads. The silent era was coming to an end, and he, like all Hollywood actors, faced an uncertain future. If anything, his prospects were even more unstable, as he was not affiliated with one of the major studios. Working with producer Joseph M. Skank, he made films at his own studio lot, formerly the Metro Studios, in Hollywood, located at the corner of Lillian Way and Eleanor. While completing the 1927 film College, Keaton was approached by director Charles Reisner with a story idea. Borrowing its title from a 1910 folk song, the movie treatment follows a pampered New Englander who is reunited with his father, a crusty riverboat captain, and must prove his heroism to win the heart of a girl. Keaton was immediately interested. In some ways, this would be a return to Keaton's favorite film, The General. Only, instead of a pair of full-size steam locomotives, the action would center around two Mississippi paddle wheels. Keaton was almost as fascinated by boats as he was by trains. They figure prominently in The Navigator, The Boat, and The Love Nest. and appear in numerous other films as effective sources of comedy. While the general climaxed against the backdrop of a Civil War battle, Steamboat Bill Jr. would have a spectacle just as grand, a catastrophic flood. In his book Silent Echoes, Discovering Early Hollywood Through the Films of Buster Keaton, John Bengtson pinpoints the locations at which Steamboat Bill Jr. was filmed. The streets of River Junction were built along the banks of the Sacramento River, just at the point at which it merges with the American River. If one looks carefully, one can get a glimpse of downtown Sacramento in the distance. The train depot of River Junction was in reality the Freeport, California station, just south of Sacramento. During pre-production, a publicity man suggested to producer Joe Skank that audiences might find a flood an inappropriate source of comedy. The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, in which 246 people were killed, had occurred just a few months prior. In his autobiography, My Wonderful World of Slapstick, Keaton recalled, quote, At the last minute, my producer decided that would be too harrowing on the audience and we settled for a hurricane as a more restful type of calamity to watch. To compensate for the change, the sets for the climax had to be redesigned at a cost of nearly $35,000. In the end, Keaton still got his flood, only instead of bringing the water up around the buildings, they had to lower the buildings into the water. The destructive force of a hurricane opened the door to larger, more dynamic set pieces than a flood. Temporary buildings were constructed and then pulled apart by cables attached to a large crane. was constructed at the end of a 120-foot crane. Without a doubt, the most famous stunt was also the most dangerous, the scene in which the facade of a house crashes down around a dazed and confused Willie. 
The gag had appeared in several Keaton films already, but on a much smaller scale. In Backstage, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle is the near victim of the falling house front. Keaton borrowed the gag for his short film, One Week. In Steamboat Bill Jr., Keaton raised the stakes and truly put his life on the line. It has been suggested that Keaton was struggling with depression at this stage of his career. His marriage to actress Natalie Talmadge had disintegrated. Joseph Skank had just informed Keaton that he was abandoning independent production and would be working for United Artists full-time. Skank suggested Keaton accept a contract at MGM and allow Buster Keaton Productions to fold. Of the stunt, Keaton later said, I was mad at the time, or I would never have done the thing. During the silent era, it was common practice for filmmakers to create two or more 35mm negatives of their films, one for domestic distribution, and one or more to be shipped overseas for the striking of prints for international markets. Steamboat Bill Jr. was shot in this way, and we are fortunate today to have complete 35mm prints derived from each of its two negatives. To the casual observer, they appear identical. But a careful comparison reveals they are comprised of completely different material, two entirely separate versions of Steamboat Bill Jr. We don't know for sure which surviving element was used for which market, so we are identifying them according to their archival provenance. The sharper, more stable version comes from the Buster Keaton estate, archived in the Raymond Rohauer collection. The second version comes from the Killiam Shows archive collection. <laughs> In some cases, alternate takes of a scene were used. When the two Willie Canfields go shopping for a hat, we can see two subtly different performances by Keaton and Ernest Torrance. Most often, however, the action was filmed simultaneously with two different cameras, especially in the case of stunts and set pieces that could only be executed once. One of the film's most audacious stunts is that in which Willie clings to a tree as it is uprooted by the storm winds. The effect was achieved by dangling a tree from a cable 
and swinging it from a crane. We see the sequence from two very different angles, one looking up into the sky, the other peering down. It appears that the action is different in the two shots, indicating that the stunt was performed more than once. Steamboat Bill Jr. was completed in the early fall of 1927. Initially budgeted at $300,000, the cost had risen to more than $400,000 by the time it was completed. Like Keaton's other large-scale comedy, The General, Steamboat Bill Jr. was a commercial disappointment, grossing $358,000 domestically, failing to recoup its production costs. But also like The General, Steamboat Bill Jr. has become one of Keaton's most highly regarded achievements and contains moments of comic brilliance that have become iconic representations of the slapstick movement. After the completion of Steamboat Bill Jr., Keaton took Skank's advice and went to work for Skank's brother, Nicholas, at MGM. Keaton called it, quote, the worst mistake of my career. Against my better judgment, I let Joe Skank talk me into giving up my own studio. For a time, Keaton's films maintained the inventive visual style that had become his trademark but his dissatisfaction with the studio system continued to build, and his career began a gradual decline from which it would never fully recover. For Keaton, as it had for a great many of his contemporaries, the glory days of slapstick had come to an end.